Hello, I'm uh, recording a video from some data that I compiled in mid-October. Um, it's still pretty relevant as uh, an analysis from before this next flu season started, um, and I hope you find some value in this. Uh, so over the recent months, I've researched many deeply troubling topics related to the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, but for now, uh, this is just a fresh collection of raw data which I wanted to inform my own opinions and risk assessments on our collective situation. All of the data presented here is from the CDC and or the Census Bureau, except the mortality and population data from Maryland before 1968, which came from the Maryland Department of Health. I would love to find similar historical data for DC, Florida, and Arizona, if anyone can find them. I have done my best to get this 100% accurate, but please feel free to check my work and offer any corrections. First, we're going to look at the United States, uh, and figure one here is all-cause mortality as a crude percentage of the population for over the last century. All of the graphs here have a data point for 2020, and that is calculated as the sum of all the weeks from September 2019 through August 2020. In the United States as a whole, this totaled a record high of 3.1 million deaths, or 0.94% of the population. According to the CDC, 2020 is the United States' deadliest year since this level was a new low in 1970. You can see 2020 looks within the range of oscillations between bad flu seasons uh, compared to a Spanish flu pandemic, which looks altogether different. Next, we've got United States all-cause mortality as a crude percent of population by age group from 1968 through 2020. Since this virus has claimed far more deaths of old people than younger people, I thought it appropriate to break out the data, and that was accessible. You can see that for people under the age of 85, almost every year has been safer than the last in terms of their crude percentage risk of dying. 2020 represents a slight uptick. For 75 to 85 year olds, it's only as deadly as 2013. For 65 to 75 year olds, it was the most deadly year since 2008. And of course, our oldest elders got hit the hardest, and they had their most deadly year since 2005. This kind of data is useful for standardizing populations by age group, but I just wanted to graphically see it, how our country has evolved over the years. Next, we've got weekly all-cause mortality in the United States as a crude rate per million from September through August, from 2015 through 2020. Here you can see the red line is 2020, and the first peak is maybe double the size of the peak we had in 2018, which was not a pandemic. And the second lump uh, in the red line for 2020 represents the other parts of the country that are going through their first wave. Once again, I find this graph to be compelling evidence that this is closer to a bad seasonal flu than a 1918 scale pandemic. Next, we've got weekly United States all-cause mortality as a crude rate per million from September 2019 through August 2020. This is a cleaner version of the previous graph where the past years are put into one average line, the blue line. And below I've graphed the recorded excess deaths as well as the ones that were marked as COVID cases. And presumably the gap between the yellow line and the green line are deaths not caused by COVID. Um, Next, we've got all-cause mortality again with the Imperial Model College overlaid as a crude rate per million. Now, they didn't offer the numbers in these terms, so I had to build my own curve that added up to their prediction over the same time span they predicted. In this graph, the blue line shows a hypothetical 2.2 million national excess deaths approximated by the Imperial College models in March. This is added to the 20. 15 through 2019 all-cause average. Then you can see the orange line is what was actually observed thus far according to best estimates by the CDC. All of that is stacked on the yellow line which is the average of the past five years. Considering that all of the policies implemented over the past eight or nine months 
were intended to slow the spread to save the lives from hospital overflow. I have yet to see any compelling evidence that those policies took something similar to one of the imperial college curves and turned it into what we've observed. I'm open to new evidence, but I have not seen it yet. Next, we've got the CDC's graph of the U.S. number of deaths on a weekly basis, both excess and expected. So here you see deaths that are expected in the orange line over the year, oscillating between the cold and warm parts of the year. Here you can see that for almost every week over the past three years, fewer people died than expected. You can see the, the small blip from 2018 where that bad flu season was just slightly higher than the expected death rate, comparable to how much lower it's been every week since then. So when you see the bars to the right during the first wave of viral spread and during the lockdown policies, I would be surprised if the sum of the excess deaths above the, the expected threshold on the right end of this graph have yet to even out the past three years of under morbidity. This is what some have referred to as the dry tinder hypothesis. Next we've got the daily new cases and the daily new deaths in the United States. This graph shows the percentage of visits for influenza-like illnesses reported by the U.S. Outpatient Influenza-like Illness Surveillance Network. Here you can see the green curve is the 2019-2020 coronavirus pandemic. Um, and given how many symptoms are overlapping with other definitions of influenza-like illnesses, I would have expected a higher percentage of coronavirus patients this season if there was a serious pandemic. Maryland is where I've lived most of my life and where I live now, and that's where I started this state-by-state -state data search. So similar to the national data, we did have a record number of deaths this year, but that equated to 0.92% of the population, which is the deadliest year we've seen since 1953. But once again, when you compare this with a much more serious pandemic, like in 1918, it puts our current year into perspective. And these estimated death tolls from the past pandemics are just a simple percentage of Maryland's population out of the whole United States population. Next, we've got all-cause mortality broken up by age group in Maryland. And similar to the national stats, once you break up the death tolls by age group, it starts to look much safer for each age group uh, than it does overall. For 85-year-olds and older, this was only the most deadly year since 2003. And for 75 to 84-year-olds in Maryland, uh, that's the red line, um, this was the most deadly year since 2011. And for 65 to 74-year-olds, it was the most deadly year since 2008. So you can see these are fairly slim margins in terms of the existential proportions being promoted. Similar to the nationwide data, I've got a graph of the age group size. Here again, we've got weekly Maryland all-cause mortality. And you can see how far above 2020 has been uh, compared to the last five years. And again, that graph cleaned up with the five-year average in the blue line and the 2020 all-cause estimates. This is weekly data from the CDC. And below we've got the excess deaths, those above the five-year average in the yellow line, and the subset of those that were labeled as COVID-related in the green line. Next, we've got the Maryland fact check of the Imperial College model. Now, we're going to prove this in a minute. But Maryland has already been through its first wave, and at the time of collecting this data, it was largely over. And that was the same curve that the Imperial College model was forecasting. So here in the blue line, you see the hypothetical 2.2 million national excess deaths projected by the Imperial College model. 
and then we see Maryland's observational data in the orange line. This is the scale to which the models were off. Once again, this is the CDC's excess versus expected number of deaths uh, filtered for Maryland. And here, just like the nationwide trend, we see almost three years with fewer people dying than expected. And then we see a partial catch up in this spring. Next, we've got the new daily cases in Maryland compared with the new daily deaths. These are both world of meter screenshots taken. And you can see here, this is before the next flu season has started in Maryland. Um, and the first wave, when you look at the daily deaths here, it is pretty much over. We've, we've been in the long tail since July of this curve, and the cases are totally unrelated. So this is what many researchers have been calling a case-demic, when there is lots of testing, uh, especially with tests that give lots of false positives, and the case numbers are totally unrelated to the death numbers. And if the death numbers aren't there and fear-mongering is just on cases, some people are calling that a case-demic. Next, I tried to gather data on Washington, D.C., because that's where I was born, and I've got many family and friends there. This first graph shows all-cause mortality as a crude percentage of population, and according to the CDC, the District of Columbia had its deadliest year since 2002. Next, we've got the District of Columbia mortality data broken out by age group. I don't know why the data for Washington, D.C. by age group is so much more irregular than the individual states. Um, but it's probably due to more transient population, people coming in and out, different administrations. But it is clear that um, at least for 65 to 75 year olds, it, it was a one of their most deadly years in DC during this time span. And then for 45 to 64 year olds, actually, it was the most deadly year since before 1968. Here are the demographic uh, age group sizes. Um, in DC. You can see they've got slightly different trends than the country as a whole. Here we have weekly District of Columbia all-cause mortality compared with the previous five years. There is a definite spike there. Here it is cleaned up a little bit. And here's the spike that DC experienced compared to the spike that Imperial College models predicted. Uh, looks like my graphs cut off there. Um, but you can see when you look at the excess versus expected in DC, it follows a similar pattern where most weeks over the past few years had many fewer deaths than expected. Next, very similar to Maryland, we can see that the first wave rolled through Washington, DC and was in the long tail by July at which point uh, testing fluctuated going up and down but is not related to excess mortality. Next, I want to see what was going on with Florida so far, even though they aren't done with their first wave yet. According to the CDC, September 2019 through August 2020 was Florida's deadliest year since 1995. Broken out by age group, we see a similar pattern with Floridians over 85 having the deadliest year since only 2010. Um, 75 to 84 year olds the deadliest year since 2020 12 and 65 to 74 year olds their deadliest year since 2005. Similar age group patterns as many states. Here's the weekly data for 2020 in red compared to the last five years and there's a definite spike but only relative to the last six years. Here's this year's spike again uh, in orange compared to the 2015 through 2019 all-cause average in blue. Here's the Imperial College model, and you can see how Florida is on a different schedule as Maryland and DC with their wave in progress at the time of this data analysis. Their wave appeared to be at least plateauing, if not on the downswing at this time, and it's reasonable to say that the Imperial College models were way off. Next, we've got excess versus expected mortality, uh, similar to the other graphs for the other jurisdictions, most of the previous three years had fewer deaths than expected every week. And a portion of that, quote, dry tinder, 
has gone up in flames during this pandemic. Now, once again, we've got the daily new cases in Florida. And for one reason or another, this looks less like a case-demic and does seem to correlate more than many states. Next, I wanted to check out Arizona, which seems to be on a schedule closer to Florida in terms of getting the first wave of the virus later than the coasts. Here you can see that at this stage, it was already the deadliest year in Arizona since before 1968. But once we break it down by age group, we see similar patterns to the other states. And for no age group was this year more deadly than 20 years ago so far. Here's the weekly all-cause mortality in Arizona. Again, a spike. Here's that graph cleaned up. And here's the Arizona spike observed in orange versus the hypothetical 2.2 million American excess deaths projected by the Imperial College models. Once again, in Arizona, there were almost three years of fewer than expected deaths that have been partially compensated. And finally, the daily new cases in Arizona compared to the daily new deaths. Um, these numbers correlate decently. This doesn't look like a case-demic like we see in some other jurisdictions. So I've, I've included all my sources here, and I've also included this spreadsheet that I used to build all these graphs. Um, but I think this perspective is very important. Uh, I think it's important to put things in a bigger perspective than just the last five years. When I look at these graphs, I do not see valid evidence for the suspension of any basic freedoms, and I don't see any justification to destroy local economies.